Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, we have a wonderful audience out there. I'm David Blight. Uh, I direct the Gilda Lehrman Center for the Study of Slavery and Abolition at Yale University. This is a special panel we have uh, created with the Fortunoff Center uh, here at Yale, uh, the famous and important collection of Holocaust testimonies, and I should say lots of wonderful programming like this one we have collaborated on uh, in organizing. Uh, this is on comparative racial regimes, comparing three systems, uh, the Nazi racial uh, laws and rules during the Third Reich, uh, apartheid in South Africa, and the Jim Crow system in the United States uh, in the early 20th century. Uh, we're going to begin with an opening set of remarks by my colleague here at Yale, the historian Tim Snyder. Uh, it it uh, goes without saying right now for most of you, I'm sure, that there is probably no more indispensable historian in the United States right now uh, than, than Tim Snyder on questions of Russia, uh, the Ukraine war, uh, Vladimir Putin, Poland, uh, but even beyond that on, on the great issues of our moment. Uh, democracy and whether it can survive tyranny and what it is and how it comes about. Uh, Tim teaches uh, the history of Eastern Europe and Central Europe uh, and the Holocaust uh, here at Yale. He is a uh, uh, advisor, or the advisor, I believe, on the faculty to the Fortunoff Center. He's the author of many, many books. I won't mention all of them. I'll just mention a few for those of you who may or may not know. He's the author of uh, Reconstruction of Nations, which is all about the making and remaking of Eastern European nations. Uh, the Red Prince, biography of a Habsburg Archduke. Uh, Thinking the 20th century, perhaps one of my favorites, which he did in collaboration with the late Tony Judd. Uh, that Tiny little now best-selling book on tyranny, uh, which I'm sure many of you have. The book Bloodlands, another of my own favorites, and many other works. Uh, and there was no better person to ask to introduce this session comparing these three vast racial regimes uh, than Tim Snyder. Uh, Tim, thank you so much for doing this today. and. Uh, over to you. Okay, thank you very much, David. And thanks, thanks to all of you for being here. Thanks especially to the colleagues who are going to go deeply into these, into these three cases in, in the session itself. The, the, the form my little introduction here is going to take is, is not a discussion of the, the three cases on which I'm, I'm really not, not expert. Um, the, the form that this is going to take is, is going to be rather a reflection on comparison and on interaction and uh, on what we're doing when we're comparing and on what we're doing when we discuss interaction. So as, as David kindly pointed out, um, some of my work has involved interaction. So I, the, the book Bloodlands is about a territory between German and Soviet power. My book, Black Earth, has something to do with the importance of the history of colonization in the history of the Holocaust, and in particular, the relevance of Africa to the history of the European Holocaust. My book, Road to Unfreedom, also does a certain amount of, of American-Russian um, interaction and has to do with the history of fascism broadly. So I, I, my, my own priors is that I, I take it for granted that, that interaction and comparison are, are very normal forms of historical work. What I just want to talk about now, I hope in a clarifying way, is, is what comparisons are and what interaction is and how they're not the same thing. And, and how it's important for us to have, I think, those two different modes in mind as we start to, as we start to broach a number of cases at the same time or in the same panel or in the same, in the same discussion. So let me start by saying a word about comparison and what it means, what we do when we, when we compare. So 
The first thing we do when we compare implicitly or explicitly is that we assume that there is some higher level abstraction to which our cases belong, right? So notice the language I'm already using. As soon as we talk about comparison, then we're talking about cases and we're talking about cases of something. So cases of what? In, in, the, in, in, in the case of, of this panel, we're talking about a higher level abstraction, which is racial regime. So when we compare, we're implicitly talking about cases and we're implicitly or explicitly talking about a higher level, higher level abstraction, a category into which those cases belong. That can be very productive. It can also be confusing when the higher level abstraction is itself contested or unsure, right? So if we're gonna talk about comparative racial regimes, then at some point we have to be able to come forward and say what a racial regime is or else the activity of comparing them will itself break down. A good example of how this goes wrong or at least gets very fuzzy from my own field would be the word genocide. So the, the, the category genocide um, is a higher level abstraction, allows you to, 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 group, to group things into cases and make comparisons, but people are very often not clear on what they actually mean when they say genocide. Is it the definition which we find in the 1948 convention? Um, is it the notion that every, on the other, at the other end of the scale, is it the notion that every single person in the group is going to be killed? Is it somewhere in between? And so if, if we group cases under a higher level abstraction, which itself is not clear, then we start to have problems. And I just, I'm giving this sort of classic example in my field. Um, I, I myself have, have never used the word genocide as an analytical category in history, because I think when people use it, they, they just generally are not in, in, a, in a concert of understanding of what that term actually means. In, in the case of this particular discussion, um, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna raise the question of where the category starts and stops. So I, I, do know, I, I do know something about the history of Nazi Germany, much less about the other two cases. And here, you know, there's no doubt that there is a, something like a racial regime in Nazi Germany. Um, my, my query would be in Nazi Germany, where does that racial regime stop and where do other things start, right? So as in, in terms of anti-Semitism, if we group Nazi Germany together, for example, with the Jim Crow South, then the idea that the laws about Jews were racial laws seems quite clear and self-evident. Um, but if we then jump forward and realize that all the, the Nazi aspiration, not very many years after that, is going to be to exterminate all of the Jews, we can, I think, legitimately ask if that's a racial regime or whether it's something else. And if it's something else, then we can ask ourselves, what is the relationship between the racial regime and the policy of mass extermination? In, in my own view, um, the, ra the racial regime has an awful lot to do with the United States. It not only looks familiar, but it is familiar because of the American example, but that Hitler's idea that Jews are responsible for all harm to Germans and basically all ideas and all ethics in general is probably something that escapes the category of, of, a, racial, of a racial regime. Um, and then, of course, the other issue with Nazi Germany is that the the, 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 the racial scale, at least in my reading of the evidence, others will differ. The racial scale involves lots of other groups besides Jews and Germans. That dyad of Jews and Germans is, is not really, I think, very helpful in, in terms of understanding the racial hierarchy, because in some sense, both the Jews and the Germans were outside it. The Jews were, at the, the Jews were not at the bottom, at least again, in my reading of the sources, but the Jews were somewhere else. They were something beyond a race, something more than a race. Whereas the Germans were us, and since they're us, they're also not a race. They're not in the same, they're not, not a race in the sense of being a hierarchy, because belonging to a group, like in a fascist mentality, belonging to a group is something special, right? It's not objective, it's not part of a gradation. Whereas the Slavs, and so on are on a gradation and there are racial policies that are applied to, to Slavs. Okay, so indulge me, I'm talking about ideas where I've, I've done some thinking before. Let me now go back to some more, um, to some more general remarks. When we compare, when we talk about cases, um, one, thing that we, one thing that we should be aware that we're doing is that we're separating them, 
and that you know that 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 may be appropriate for the exercise, right? It may not com- it may not actually um, comport with with reality, but in order to carry out the, a comparison, we have to assume that these things are in some sense separate, if only analytically separate, that they are phenomena that one can look at separately. Because if you can't look at them separately, you can't identify their features. And if you can't identify their features, then you can't compare them. If, I mean, if you'll accept the very stupid analogy, if you're doing a laboratory ex- experiment and you have one thing in a Petri dish and another thing in another Petri dish, you can compare them. But once you know you start pouring the things from one dish into the other dish, you're no longer carrying out a comparison. But history, of course, is very involves a lot of things sloshing around together. And so com- comparison um, can be more or less artificial depending upon whether or not the events in question, the phenomenon in question, are actually are actually in, in contact. Now, when we compare, and I'm sure this is something that's going to come up. Um, what we often confront is a taboo on comparison. Certainly, I've confronted this um, fairly regularly in my academic career, and I imagine that that those of you working on these issues will have confronted it as as well. Um, so let me just share a few thoughts about taboos on comparison. So as I've said, I mean, I, I have my reservations about comparison as a method, but I regard it as fully legitimate. Um, I don't think it is something which about around which there should be any kind of taboo and i'm just going to i'm going to share a few thoughts that i've accumulated over the years about the idea that comparison should be taboo um the first is uh is a kind of logical point that when people say uh you can't compare that really doesn't hold up logically because the only way that people can say that you can't compare is for them to have already compared Right. So the very judgment that things are incomparable is itself a comparative judgment. And as a comparative judgment, it itself violates the taboo on comparison. So it's the the the, the attempt to lay down this taboo is is logically internally contradictory. I think it functions more, and this would be my second point about the taboo, it functions more as a kind of power claim. Because if if I'm saying you can't compare and I've already compared, then really all I'm saying is that. I can compare and you can't, right? And that's not an analytical, that's not a that's not a, an argument. That's just a a power, that's just a power claim. Um, and then an, a, a consequence of, of a taboo on comparison is um is that it tends to it tends to um it tends to homogenize human experience. So it's not just it, it doesn't because it's a, a claim on the taboo of comparison isn't just directed at researchers, it's presumably directed at everyone, including peop- including the people we study. So for example, if an African-American, you know, let's say an African-American soldier in the Second World War is confronted with a concentration camp and makes a comparison, the taboo on comparison would also apply to that person. Or you know, to take an example, which is very familiar from my own field, if people experience both Nazi and Soviet rule, as tens of millions of people did, they made comparisons. But if there's a taboo on comparison, then that taboo would presumably also apply to them. And so here we have another kind of power claim, I mean, perhaps even a more sinister one, in which the researcher is claiming the ability to um, separate out actual human experiences. Um, The taboo is being applied, as it were, not just to the secondary sources, but to the primary sources. It's being applied not just to the historian, but to history. It's being applied to the people who actually um, experience history. And so, you know, what we end up with is is a kind of, you know, defense of some kind of, you know, some kind of uh, presumptive, ostensible moral absolute at the price of making history as I see it anyway, in, inhuman um, and impossible to carry to carry out. A couple of, ex- of examples of this, which I'm sure everyone will be familiar with, would be the, the Historica Streit um, in Germany in the late 1980s, or I should say West Germany, late 1980s, when um, uh, the argument was made that one cannot have the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany in the same conversation. The problem with that is that you end up, the problem, just to shorten this, um, the, 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 shorten that very complicated, in, in some ways very interesting episode, the problem with that is that then you end up having Germans talking to other Germans on the basis of German sources. In other words, in order to avoid the contamination of comparison, people ended up becoming very provincial and generating hugely implausible arguments about how the Holocaust could actually have have happened. 
A more recent example of this kind of attempt at taboo, as I'm sure that you'll remember, um, would be, um, I guess, two years ago now, the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum issued a statement saying that what ought, ought, ought not to make Holocaust analogies, which is a slightly different, um, a slightly different cut than comparisons, but overlapping. And of course, the problem with that claim that you can't make analogies is that the victims of the Holocaust made them all the time. And in addition to that, all of our words to describe the Holocaust, for example, the word Holocaust or Shoah, all of these words are themselves analogies. So if we tried to cut ourselves off from analogies, we'd be cutting ourselves off from any, any language or any thought about the events that, that we're attempting to discuss. Okay, so so much for comparison. That's I, that's the first thing I wanted to talk about. I wanted to see a few. I want to give a few remarks about comparison, what it is, where 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 it can run into some limits, um, and but, and why it's nevertheless legitimate, and and why the argument from taboo, I believe, is always a bad a bad argument. The next thing that I want to say, and I'm sure it's it's clear to all of you, I just think it's worth um, making this case sort of at the top because I think it's a kind of higher level argument about the kinds of things that we're doing, is the difference between comparison and interaction. That these are very different. These are very different things. They're in very different realms. Comparison is is an exercise um, that people might carry out in real life, but it's 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 also an exercise that we carry out in analysis. An interaction is not usually something that we think of as, as, a, as a concept. It's more something that we think that we are observing. Um, but interactions are of course very important. Oh, I should just pause on this point because it's really important. Um, a very often, and the reason why it's important is that interaction and comparison are very often confused. So if, if, if you probably encountered this, but if you say, if you make the argument, for example, that German racial law was influenced by American racial law, people's immediate reaction is, you can't compare, right? But you haven't even actually made a comparison. That's not a comparison. You're talking about an interaction, right? And so um, one defense of against you can't compare, of course, is to point out that you're not, you know, that these you're actually looking at interactions. You're looking at things that actually happen. Um, but so these are these are very different things, right? You know, relationships are not the same thing as comparisons, a marriage or a or a business contract. Um, you know, these things are relationships. They're not comparisons. They're they're interactions that involve multiple multiple actors. And inter, but of course, interactions also make people uncomfortable in different ways. Um, in in my field in East European history, people are very unhappy very often about interactions. People are unhappy if Mussolini was influenced by Lenin, which he certainly was. People are unhappy if Stalin um, made it more likely that Hitler would be elected, which is the case. People are unhappy if Hitler was inspired by Stalin's collectivization of agriculture to think that Ukrainians could be starved to death, but that's clearly also true. Um, people are unhappy that people that that collaborators with the Soviets then went on to collaborate with the Germans and, and commit German atrocities and so on. Like those kinds of interactions, although they're manifestly clear in the primary sources, um, generally tend to make people unhappy, and they make people unhappy because they force us out of 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 arguments from the nation and arguments from the state. Um, they also very often force us out of comforting ethnic stereotypes, be they positive or negative ethnic stereotypes, either way they can be comforting. And um, and, and the realization that uh, that that do, that the same person in different institutional setups can behave different ways can be very can be very uncomfortable. So anyway, these kinds of arguments from interaction, they tend to privilege um, they, they tend to privilege sociological rather than ideological explanations. Um, and of course, they, they also tend to push us away from national history and, and towards transnational history or sometimes towards global history. Yeah. So to, but to repeat where I started this point about interaction and comparison, once we start making claims like that about inter, about, you know, about how, for example, um, Jim Crow is related to Germany. Um, we are not talking, we're not making a comparison. We're, we're in a different mode. We're talking about an interaction. We're assuming, we're not assuming separation. We're assuming presence. We're assuming the presence of, of one set of actions in the minds or in the perceptions of, of another, of another group. They, you know, if we go back to my, my dumb comparison to a laboratory, this would not be a laboratory anymore, but it's more like an ecosphere. You know, it's, it's a place where things are naturally in contact one, one, one with the other. Um, and this, you know, and this allows us to ask, ask questions about German racial laws and Jim Crow, 
more broadly, you know, in, in the kind of work that I do, uh, uh, the, the relevant question would be um, the relationship between Hitler's fantasies of Lebensraum with American frontier colonialism more broadly. In Hitler's second book, it's actually quite clear that, I mean, you wouldn't want to make, you can't make this case absolutely with with 100% certainty, but it's, it's, let me put it this way, it's hard to imagine his fantasy of Lebensraum without his understanding of the way American frontier colonialism worked. Okay. So as I've said, interaction tends to push us, as I, as I imagine in some ways, this panel will push us towards global history and towards and towards entangled history. Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to stop there. I'm sure I've said enough or or more than enough. I was just trying to set the table with um, a few very basic remarks about what we're doing when we when we study interactions or what we what we're doing when we when we set up comparisons. I hope that has some framing usefulness for 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 colleagues as we go on. And I'm very grateful for your attention. Well, Tim, thanks so much. Uh, I forgot to introduce you as a logician because you are also a logician. That was a a beautifully logical journey into to what's comparison or what's interaction. Um, uh, now over to Daniel Magaziner, our brilliant colleague here at Yale, who teaches and writes about South Africa, who will moderate uh, the panel with three special guests. Uh, again, Tim Snyder, thanks so much for that opening. Of course. Thanks, my friend. Daniel, over to you. Uh, thanks, David, and and thank you, Tim, um, for those really illuminating and challenging remarks that I think will give us a lot to think about. And as we are mulling them over, um, it's my great privilege to introduce our panelists who will be adding to this stew, if I can kind of extend and change Tim's analogy of thinking through concepts of interaction and comparison. Um, we have three panelists today, and oh, I should have said, I'm Dan Magaziner, I'm a professor of history in the history department at Yale, uh, specializing in 20th century South African history. Um, our panelists today are going to be focusing, as uh, Tim indicated, on three case studies on the history of the Jim Crow South in the United States, on the racial state in Nazi Germany, and on apartheid in South Africa. The order of their presentations is a bit different than on the program because we're dealing with some power issues in Cape Town. So Dr. Tipe is going to be the last presenter for us today. But I will introduce them all and welcome them collectively and then turn it over and we'll hear the presentations and then there'll be time at the end for some interaction and conversation. Our first presenter is Dr. William Sturkey, who is an associate professor in the Department of History at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, where he's been since 2013, after having completed a postdoctoral fellowship at the Africana Research Center at Penn State. He earned his PhD in history from Ohio State University in 2012, and his MA from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in 2007. He holds a BA also from Ohio State, which he earned in 2005. Dr. Sturkey has two books forthcoming from basic books. The first, Precious Lord, Take My Hand. And the second, The Ballad of Roy Benavidez, The Life and Times of America's Most Famous Latino War Hero. His first monograph, which was published by Harvard University Press in 2019, is a history of race and place in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, entitled Hattiesburg, an American City in Black and White. In addition to this, he co-edited To Write in the Light of Freedom, the newspapers of the 1964 Mississippi Freedom Schools, which was published in 2015 by the University Press of Mississippi. He's the author of numerous articles and book chapters and is also a prominent public intellectual who shares his work in publications such as The Atlantic and The Washington Post, as well as Black Perspectives, the very influential and widely read blog of the African-American Intellectual History Society. Dr. Sturkey has presented his work in institutions across the United States and in virtual fora, given our current times, including an Author Meets Critics Roundtable on Hattiesburg at the 2021 African American Intellectual History Society meeting. Finally, I note his participation in ongoing reckoning with histories of race at institutions like UNC, including a talk with the provocative title, quote, how to Make a University Lie About Race, which he presented in Chapel Hill in 2019. That sort of work is very familiar to us here at Yale. Dr. Sturkey's talk today is entitled Closed Societies, the United States of Jim Crow, 1877 to 1965. Welcome, Dr. Sturkey. <laughs> 
Patricia Haber-Rice is the senior historian at the Mandel Center for Advanced Holocaust Studies at the United States, United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C., a position that she has held since 2016. That position culminates a very long career of service to that institution, where she has worked in various capacities since 1993. Dr. Haber Rice has a PhD in German and Central European history from the University of Maryland College Park, in addition to an MA and BA from the Southern Illinois University. She's also studied at the Free University of Berlin. A specialist in the history of Nazi medicine, and I hope the scare quotes are implied, she's presented on the subject at too many institutions to list, from locally at GW in DC to Oregon State on the other side of the country in Corvallis, to Humboldt University in Berlin, to numerous teacher and other workshops in her capacity as senior historian at the Holocaust Museum. I note in particular how frequently she addresses medical students on one of their profession's bleakest chapters. She's published numerous chapters and reviews on subjects including disability and euthanasia during the Nazi Holocaust, as well as comprehensive chapters in the Rutledge History of the Holocaust and the Oxford Handbook of Holocaust Studies. Her work is available in English, German, and French, and she's recently been published quite topically in Ukraine. She is the co-author of two books, the latest of which is Nazi Sites for Racial Persecution, Detention, Murder, and Resettlement of Non-Jews, Volume 5 of the Encyclopedia of Camps and Ghettos, which is forthcoming from Indiana University Press. She's also the author of Children During the Holocaust, Documenting Life and Destruction, Select Sources of the Holocaust, Volume 1 which was published in 2011. Dr. Haber Rice's talk today is entitled Nazi Germany, the Racial State. Finally, if the electricity holds up in Cape Town, we're pleased to welcome Dr. Tuto Tipe back to Yale. Dr. Tipe is currently a lecturer in African studies at the University of Cape Town, where she's been since February 2020, which was obviously a rather inconvenient time to begin a new position. This fall, she'll be a, post a postdoctoral scholar at the University of Chicago Department of History for two years, after which time she will transition into becoming an assistant professor of history in the college, also at the University of Chicago. Dr. Tipe earned her PhD in history and African-American studies at Yale in 2020, as well as an MA at Yale in 2018, to go along with degrees from the University of Cape Town in 2011, and McAllister College in 2010. Dr. Tipe's research focuses on the intertwined histories of land, property, com uh, property, community, and cultural life in South Africa. She's currently working on a book manuscript entitled Black Freehold Land Ownership in Alexandra Township, which is based on her award-winning dissertation at Yale. She has published chapters that consider more than a century of legal and cultural history about property rights and urbanism in South Africa, including the Oxford Handbook on South African History. And her work also extends into cultural history with articles about how black writers challenge white representations of black identities in early 20th century South Africa, as well as work about family photographs and home life in Alexandra Township, both before and during apartheid. Before embarking on her PhD, Dr. Tipe was a researcher for the Center of, of Law and Society at the University of Cape Town, where she researched how systems of traditional governance and vernacular language systems impacted property law in both historical and contemporary South Africa. That research resulted in numerous law journal and related publications, especially focused on gender, property, and the debate over so-called traditional courts in post-apartheid South Africa. Dr. Tipe's talk today is entitled The Making of Race Through Land and Citizenship in South Africa. With that, please join me in welcoming our three panelists to the GLC and the Fortunoff Center, and I will turn it over to Dr. Sturkey for our first presentation. Dr. Sturkey. Hello, can everyone hear me okay? Okay. Great. Thank you so much. Um, thanks to David for the invitation for, for being here. And um, thanks to everybody for organizing the program. So I'm going to share my screen and um, give me just one second to do that. Oh, okay. Okay, so I'm going to talk about 
the Jim Crow regime in the American South that lasted essentially from the end of Reconstruction up until the Civil Rights Movement of the 1950s and the 1960s. And I get 15 minutes to do so. So I'm going to move along at a pretty good clip. And if I miss anything, um, we can unpack any of these ideas throughout the latter part of the discussion today. But I want to start off by emphasizing three things about Jim Crow. Here you see a, an image of a Black woman using, of course, the colored only water fountain, sort of a classic Gordon Parks image of the Jim Crow South. But I want to talk about three big ideas before I get start, started. Um, the first is that Jim Crow is an American phenomenon contained within the American South, absolutely. But it's actually probably more accurate to consider each state as its own racial regime. So places like Mississippi, Texas, and Alabama all form their own regimes in ways that often ran counter to federal law, and they learn from each other, and they work together all of the time to establish and maintain the racial hierarchy that they desire. So all these different racial regimes existing within a broader uh, nation. The second thing is that Black rights were guaranteed by the Constitution. So all of these regimes are part of a nation that has laws on the books that effectively seek to prevent the system of racial apartheid that they seek to design. And so they had to operate in ways that kept them compliant within the scope of the law, while also pioneering new practices that they shared with each other in order to ensure white supremacy. And ultimately, that regime was overthrown using legal mechanisms that were older than the regime itself. Um, third is that individual and collective grassroots activism and action was essential to upholding Jim Crow. Um, Jim Crow involved a lot of laws, state legislatures, obviously, you know, the, the authority of the state, police power, et cetera. But everyday citizens and actors were highly involved in making sure that Jim Crow worked for everybody. And that involved extreme cases like murder to making sure somebody takes off their hat when they greet a white person. All of these sorts of structures um, undergird this racial regime that was Jim Crow. So of course, Jim Crow emerges after the end of Reconstruction. Reconstruction is the process by which the South and many of its citizens or residents were then folded back in the United States of America. And Reconstruction is a lot of different things, of course, we could say about Reconstruction, but I really want to highlight the Reconstruction Amendments, the 13th Amendment, 14th Amendment, and the 15th Amendment, these Reconstruction Amendments. 13th outlaws slavery, except for in cases when you are incarcerated. Um, the 14th Amendment guarantees Black citizenship, something that, that African Americans did not have, largely because of the Dred Scott decision before the Civil War. And then the 15th Amendment protects the Black vote, at least the Black male vote, in places where, um, in places where only men could vote, which of course was most of the nation. So these are important for a couple of different reasons. One is that the racial regime has to be designed around them. They are violated all of the time, but the essence of Jim Crow laws is to somehow circumnavigate um, these protections for African Americans. And so these Reconstruction Amendments were really essential to American life, but ultimately Reconstruction ends in 1876 and the process of constructing Jim Crow then begins. This is a map of the United States of America a few years after the end of Reconstruction, in, sorry, in, in 1890. And the, the darker the color on this map, the higher the percentage of Black people living in any of these areas. So at the start of the Civil War, 89% of all Black people living in the United States were enslaved in the South. And they're a huge part of this population to the current day, but certainly in the years immediately after or during and after Reconstruction. Black people are everywhere, including a majority of the population in some of the Southern states, um, including South Carolina, Louisiana, Mississippi, they had more black people than white citizens. So part of this racial regime is to ensure that minority rule can, can govern the African Americans who live there. So for many white Southerners, this Negro problem, as they often called it, wasn't the presence of African Americans. They very much wanted black people around them and to work for them. The Negro problem that they so often talked about in the years after Reconstruction was that with the end of slavery and with some of these protections guaranteed by the Reconstruction Amendments, they had to pay Black workers. They couldn't exactly control their movements as they once had, and Black people have rights. So what they seek to do is design the system that gets around these protections guaranteed in the Constitution, okay? So to design that system, 
right? Or to, to achieve those ends, they designed a new system that we now know as Jim Crow. Um, Jim Crow is named after this minstrel character. Its origins are somewhat ambiguous, but what it refers to is this system of racial apartheid lasting essentially from 1877 to 1965. People often credit the first Jim Crow law to Tennessee in 1881. Now, Tennessee state legislature passed a law that said this, railroad companies required to furnish separate cars for colored passengers who pay first class rates, cars to be kept in good repair and subject to the same rules governing other first class cars for preventing smoking and obscene language. African-American first class passengers have to have their own car. There was, however, an exception for black women who were traveling with white women in their service. See, Jim Crow was never just concerned about physical separation, even though that's precisely what so many of the laws seemingly were designed to do. Um, a few years later, Mississippi passed the railroad law requiring the state's growing railroads to, and I quote, provide equal but separate accommodation for the white and colored races by providing two or more passenger cars for each passenger train or by dividing the passenger cars by a partition so as to secure separate accommodations. Equal but separate, separate but equal, right? This comes to be the language that's often used for some of these Jim Crow laws because that does not then violate the 14th Amendment, which protects against African American civil rights, protects from that badge of slavery um, influencing their civil rights in the years after Reconstruction. So almost immediately, Mississippi was actually sued for this law that required separate cars for black and white passengers. They weren't sued by black civil rights activists. They were actually sued by the railroad company itself. The railroad company says, well, my God, what are we gonna do if every single state has a different um, you know, racial order that we need to rearrange the cars every time we pass into a new border? This doesn't make sense. It's also economically inefficient to pull half foot filled cars but you know, if we have to keep black and white people separate. But ultimately that company lost the Supreme Court case. The Supreme Court, the, sorry, this, this case went all the way to the Supreme Court, the company lost, and the Supreme Court upheld Mississippi's right to force private companies to, 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 to mandate racial segregation on railroad cars. Within 18 months of that decision, nine other states passed railroad segregation laws, including Louisiana, which passed, which passed its statute on July 10th, 1890, that was famously challenged by Homer Plessy. Of course, Homer Plessy in 1892 um, was arrested for sitting in the white section of a railroad car. He appealed all the way to the Supreme Court, which, also, which once again backed the Louisiana state law, saying that seg segregated accommodations are okay as long as they are equal, separate but equal, but we could also say equal but separate. So if you think about what just happened there, Segregation is not necessarily new in terms of society and culture, and it certainly exists outside of the South as well. But after Reconstruction, we get this new wave of laws that mandate segregation in public spaces, right? This is the separate but equal precedent that spreads through every walk of life, that it's okay, even within the scope of the 14th Amendment, it's okay to have racial segregation so long as the accommodations are equal. And we get an entire host of Jim Crow laws that follow in the wake. States learn from each other just like they did with the railroad segregation cars that were, are often credited as being the first Jim Crow laws. I'm part of a group that used machine learning to code all of the Jim Crow laws passed in North Carolina during this era. We found 900 Jim Crow laws in North Carolina alone. Some of these laws were modeled after other states and some of them presumably served as models for other states, right? The states talk to each other. They learn from each other all the time. Um, in 1890, the state of Mississippi was a pioneer in rewriting their constitution in what is known as the second Mississippi plan. The first Mississippi plan was this violent overthrow of, of um, reconstruction in 1875. The second Mississippi plan provides a model to circumvent the 15th amendment, okay? So Plessy versus Ferguson allows them to circumvent the 14th amendment. The second Mississippi plan allows them to get around the 15th amendment. So this new constitution, in 1890 included new regulations for voting. Um, we had a poll tax and a literacy test. A literacy test, also known as an understanding clause, was the way that African-Americans were disfranchised all across the South. These practices were also upheld with the court case Williams versus Mississippi. So literacy tests um, are really important. And here's an example of a, of a 
white registrar giving to African Americans a literacy test. A literacy test required voters to pass either a written or a verbal examination in order to register to vote. The thinking here, or the justification here, let's say, is, well, shouldn't only informed citizens be allowed to vote? People who are actually paying attention to what's going on. Okay, that's sort of the thinking of it. But the process and results of the literacy test were extremely racialized. So what they allowed the local registrar to do was to look at people who applied to register to vote and to judge basically whether they were black or white. If they were white, they might get an extremely easy test. In some cases, they might just literally sign their name. There were numerous cases where, where the federal government later found that people who were literally illiterate couldn't sign their own name, somehow passed literacy tests. With, with black applicants, on the other hand, they might be giving, given some random obscure section of the state constitution to interpret. Um, there was one registrar in Mississippi who was literally asking people how many bubbles are in a bar of soap. The question, the answers didn't matter at all. The sole goal was to give the registrar the authority to make sure that African-Americans couldn't vote. So in this way, we got a new state law, but the process of making sure that black people were disfranchised was actually involving thousands of people, just like this man named Thurin Lind in Forest County, Mississippi, who did the work every day of making sure that African-Americans could not vote. They were invested with the power from the state, but they were also people who were acting, you know, sometimes on their own at individual courthouses. And so black people were effectively removed from the voter rolls. Well, what happened with literacy tests and that Mississippi, the second Mississippi plan was that every other state in the South followed that pattern. Between 1890 and 1908, every single state in the former Confederacy involved, rewrote their state constitution to bring in literacy tests and poll taxes and other methods in order to prevent African-Americans from voting. Jim Crow touched every walk of life. Obviously, many of you are very familiar with the stories behind Brown versus Board of Education and sharecropping and different things like that. Um, but there was etiquette. It touched certainly healthcare systems. Um, but one of the most overlooked ways that Jim Crow touched everyday Americans was that there was a social and cultural component to Jim Crow that had to be learned and taught. Black people learned the lessons from their parents and communal experiences. They also learned the lessons out in society. Perhaps the most tragic example of that is just everyday moments like you see here on the left of my screen, a, another Gordon Parks photograph of young black girls watching white kids play on a playground that they know they are not allowed to play on because they are African-American. Or this little girl on the right looking at you know, white mannequin dolls wearing dresses that she could not try on. Perhaps she couldn't even enter the store. And it involves all of these behavioral expectations out in public. For some people, it just became so natural that they didn't even remember where or how they learned it. These lessons had just been a part of their lives. It fundamentally shaped their expectations. Ariel Barnes, born in Scott County, Mississippi, remembered, and I quote, it was never really explained to me. I just sort of, I just came up sort of knowing what it was, you know? It was just there. We would meet white girls on the street and we just knew to move over. And of course, all of this was backed by extraordinary examples of racial violence. When people think about racial violence, they often think of lynching and rightfully so, but the violence entailed other smaller encounters as well. Every, you know, beatings, punches, thrown bricks, sexual violence, or even just the threat of violence was a major part of this system. And African-Americans living in that system did not have to directly experience the violence for it to become a threat. All they needed was a story or a rumor or an example to understand the potential consequences of violating the norms of Jim Crow. Of course, lynchings were the most dramatic example of racial violence. Between 1882 and 1968, nearly 5,000 people were lynched in the United States. People had been lynched before and people were lynched outside of the South. But this type of lynching, this racialized violence was adapted to this new South, this Jim Crow era. Um, when people think of lynching, they, they might often think of a small group of Klansmen lynching somebody out in the middle of the woods at 3 a.m. or something like that. But many Southern lynchings involved hundreds, if not thousands of people who might gather during the day or even early evening hours for these murders. It was common for everyday people to be involved um, to sometimes shoot bullets into the corpses or to even collect souvenirs from the body, such as an ear, a finger, or a penis, and print post images on postcards and send them to friends talking about the violence that they had participated in. 
And of course, it's important to realize that these punishments were not just meant for the living, but rather to create the sense of terror for other African-Americans who challenged the Jim Crow system saying, this is what could happen to you. So that's a very broad overview in 15 minutes. I will go ahead and stop there and turn it over to the next panelists. Thank you. Here we go. Can you take down your screen? There we go. Hello, everybody. It is such a pleasure to be here. I'm very excited that my hosts have invited me here today. It's an honor and a privilege to be with such distinguished panelists, of course, in the Fortuna of uh, Holocaust, oral history, testimony, archive, a very distinguished facility. Um, at the outset of um, the planning for this particular event, our host asked us, sent us some questions to reflect on, to sort of temper our remarks. And they asked, you know, what's the nature of race in the regime that you're looking at? What are the similarities between them and the other case studies that you're going to hear about today? And what's the legacy? And so I've sort of tried to cast my discussion today along those lines. So Nazi Germany has often been called the racial state. Its ideology combined disdain for liberal democracy and bourgeois politics with anti-communism, virulent anti-Semitism, adherence to eugenic principles and scientific racism. At the core of the movement's belief system was the idea that the German folk was part of a superior master race. Hitler and the Nazis believed that the Germanic or Nordic race was the purest of races, that it was descended from an ancient Aryan race, these Aryans were seen as the original speakers, if we want to get down to the nitty gritty, the original speakers of the Proto-Indo-European language. So they are sort of the Proto-Europeans, if you will. They are the builders of Indo-European culture. And this race then migrated to the Northern European plain uh, around the area of Germany, at, where it remained unmixed with others for generations, for centuries. Now, this is a pretty crazy idea when you think about it. Germany is in Central Europe. It is at a natural crossroads uh, where the cross fertilization of peoples would naturally occur. I'm also thinking some Iranians in our audience might be thinking, well, we didn't immigrate to Europe. We're right here. We built our culture where we lived. But the Nazis didn't let these facts or common sense dislodge their ideas of racial superiority. Uh, and this superiority had implications. First, it meant that the Nazis, according to this scheme or schema, had the right to expand territorially. And it meant second, that all other races, of course, were inferior to them uh, within a certain schema. So let's look what this means. Um, the Nazis had a lot of enemies, real and perceived. Many of them are what our museum likes to define as enemies of belief and enemies of action. An enemy of belief would be someone like a Jehovah's Witness whose religion entails accepting no temporal authority, including the authority of the state over that of gods. And so this belief would have brought Jehovah's Witnesses at loggerheads and did uh, bring them at loggerheads with national socialism with the Nazis. An enemy of action would be a political opponent, a resistance figure whose action gets them into conflict with the Nazis. Uh, these enemies were, of course, targeted and persecuted. But Nazi policymakers saved their most radical measures of persecution for what, one, what, for what we might call the Nazis' biological enemies. That is, the biological enemies of this group, the supposed biological uh, makeup, because of course there is no basis for this in science. So the biological makeup of these individuals and these groups make them or made them the enemies of the Nazi regime. The Nazis vilified Jews as the ultimate other, insisting they were not a religion, but a race. And at that, the most inferior of the races, the absolute other, as Timothy Schneider talked about earlier in his discussion. Many ideologues describe Jews as a germ, a pathogen, a cancer that ate at and corrupted the German body politic and insisted that it should be excised and eradicated. They viewed Roman Sinti, the so-called gypsies, as at once a biological enemy and 
a criminal element upon German soil and called for their expulsion. They viewed the Slavic races as inferior and proposed their subjugation. And even within what they considered their racial community as they had constructed it, Nazi officials expanded the notions of scientific racism beyond the ideas of race to target so-called hereditarily ill as the Nazis described them, those whom we would today identify as persons with mental, physical, or social disabilities and called for their marginalization from society. So that's the Nazi construct of race in a nutshell. And so again, in keeping with the program today and what we've been asked to reflect on what's universal about this regime and what's unique, I'm, I'm not sure any governmental system is entirely unique or entirely universal, but I think what makes Nazi regime so interesting is that it really starts out as a fringe movement of the extreme radical right. And as such, Nazism, I think, shares many of the common traits that mark other extremist movements and extremist governments, past and present, that one can argue are universal. Um, and I did, had a conversation with a psychologist and co-founder of the National Center for the Study of Terrorism and the Response to Terrorism at the University of Maryland, Professor Ari Kuglonski, who also is a Holocaust survivor in his own right. And according to him, as I understand it, extremist movements almost always share three characteristics. First, the idea that they need to belong to a group. With the Nazis, of course, that is the idea that the Germans together form a folk and a part of that superior Aryan race I just described. Second, the group has sustained a trauma or an injury. In this case, the Germans in this particular period, it's the loss of World War I. It's the loss of territories, the limitation of its army, navy, and air force, the humiliating Versailles Treaty with its war guilt clause, the enormous war debt that Germany is required to pay. And the German nation unites over this trauma of defeat and the Versailles Treaty and nurses its grievances. And the Nazis claim that they're going to right this wrong. And finally, the third tenet that identifies a lot of extreme movements along the, the spectrum is the idea of the exclusion of the other. Um, we, as a result of this trauma, we repay this injury by excluding the other. And of course, with the Nazis, there are a lot of groups, there are a lot of others, but clearly the ultimate other is the Jew. It was the Jews and the socialists at home, the Nazis argue, who, um, facilitate this humiliating surrender in the First World War, this stab in the back, and it makes them our enemies and makes them, we will make them pay through persecution. The National Socialists from the beginning exhibit those hallmarks that we can see with radical movements and some radical governments playing out in almost every case. So what's universal with the Nazis? That's perhaps unique or uncommon in the Nazi case um, so that's what's universal, but what's unique or uncommon in this case is that Nazi Germany starts out to be this marginalized movement. And most of our extremist movements today in Western society are still on the fringe. They have a different narrative uh, than mainstream society does. But what makes the Nazis different here is that the Nazis in the 1930s and 40s become that mainstream, and they make that racialist and anti-Semitic narrative government policy in a very concrete and radical way. So let's get to the real crux of the issue of our discussion today. Do Nazis borrow strategies from other racist regimes that we've talked about, that, or we will talk about today, and are those policies similar, or are those policies similar to the regimes uh, we're going to talk about today in some significant way. And I would say yes, definitely, and relatively early on in the process. For example, Nazi officials were really inspired by American eugenicists, uh, especially concerning America's very early uh, sterilization laws. The U.S. had the first federal, uh, so the first uh, sterilization laws. We are a federal institution or federal system, so those laws went state by state, with the state of Indiana in 1907 having the first 
uh, compulsory sterilization law that we know anywhere. And the US was the world leader in sterilizations before 1933. California and Virginia, I realize um, a lot of these states are outside uh, the Jim Crow South, though some of them, Virginia, are within the Jim Crow South. And these sterilizations in the 1950s take on racial, um, racial rather than eugenic uh, characteristics. Uh, many, many more individuals uh, are blacks are sterilized rather than whites uh, in the 1950s as a result of this law. But really it's California and Virginia that continued to sterilize individuals at a fairly constant pace well into the 1950s. And those two states account alone for almost half of the estimated total of about 60,000 eugenic sterilizations in the United States in total. Uh, and so Nazi Germany looked at the US as a leader in eugenic policies like sterilization, and they create their own law on the 14th of July, 1933, just six months after the Nazis come to power. The Hitler cabinet promulgates the law for the prevention of progeny with hereditary diseases, it's also called the hereditary health law. And this ordered the compulsory sterilization of persons with certain disorders or disabilities. Individuals with intellectual disabilities, certain psychiatric disorders like schizophrenia or bipolar disorders, certain physical disabilities like hereditary deafness or blindness made one subject to sterilization in Nazi Germany. The law was modeled itself on Harry Laughlin, the US eugenicist model sterilization law of 1922, a fact of which American eugenicists were very proud. And medical professionals were now duty bound to report patients with these disorders in the exercise of their practice. And this new law takes effect in January of 1934 and it's nationwide in Nazi Germany. And from then, January 1934, until May of 1945, the end of war in Europe, some 400,000 Germans are forcibly sterilized under the terms of this Nazi sterilization law. The vast majority of these persons are individuals with mental disabilities and mental illness, but diagnosis like hereditary feeble-mindedness, which at that time was a, a real medical diagnosis, um, but very nebulous. And its ambiguous diagnosis allowed officials to include not only those with a legitimate disability, but also those who are outside the mores of German society. And I think, most directly to the point of South Africa under apartheid and the Jim Crow South, especially after 1948, uh, the similarities are there, of course, in anti-miscegenation laws. While Germany had no such laws until the Nazi era, of course, laws prohibiting the marriage of white Americans and Americans of color had been on the books since colonial times. And many Nazi officials were keen to apply these kinds of laws to German Jews. And they did so in September, 1935, in the midst of the seventh annual Nuremberg party rally. Nazi leaders promulgated the so-called Nuremberg racial laws. These laws are really significant because they lay the foundation for all future anti-Jewish legislation in Nazi Germany. And the second of these laws was the so-called law for the protection of German blood and German honor. And this law banned marriage between Jews and non-Jewish Germans, so-called Aryans, and criminalized sexual relations between them. And implementing decrees for the law defined who was a Jew and extended the law to ban marriage between German Aryans and Roma and Sinti and Blacks, so-called um, African Germans, if you will, um, uh, right after in the, in the next month. So that law was expanded to include, as I said again, Roman Sinti, so-called gypsies, and Blacks living in Germany. And while we're focusing on that 1935 Nuremberg race law, just to be specific, there are three laws in those racial laws. This law for the protection of German blood and German honor, which I just discussed. There's a flag law that's not really significant in this case. And then there's the other significant Nuremberg law that bears some similarity, I guess, and I, I hope that my the next uh, speaker bears me out, a similarity to apartheid. And that's the Reich Citizenship Law. The Reich Citizenship Law of 1935 declared that only people of German or kindred blood could be citizens of Germany. 
And there was a supplementary decree published on November 14th, uh, the day the law went into effect, that would have been 1935, who defined who was a Jew and who was not a Jew. And despite the persistent claims of Nazi uh, ideology, there were no valid bases to define Jews as a race. Nazi legislators looked therefore to family genealogy and decided that people with three or more grandparents born into the Jewish religious community were Jews by law. Grandparents born into the German religious community were considered racially Jewish. And so under this law, Jews in Germany were not citizens, but if you will, the best translation perhaps we can make in this case is that they were subjects of the state, bereft of traditional civil rights. Uh, and of course, there are other numerous decrees that we see mainly in 1939, after the nationwide Kristall pogrom of November 1938, that bar Jews from certain professions, that ban Jews in public spaces and public transportation that will look very uh, familiar to uh, my other uh, speakers on the virtual podium today. So finally, what are the legacies uh, from Nazi Germany? Uh, what is its legacy? And of course, the terrible legacy of the Nazi regime was the Holocaust. The Holocaust narrowly defined, that is the genocide of European Jewry. And of course, the Holocaust in its broader interpretation, not only the million, uh, the murder of 6 million Jews, uh, but the murder of 250,000 Roman Sinti, the figures go at least 250,000 Roman Sinti, so-called gypsies, and as high as 500,000. The murder of 3.3 million Soviet POWs, um, the murder of 250,000 German disabled patients, the murder of 1.8 to 1.9 million uh, Gentile Poles, countless non-Jewish Soviet civilians, in short, the murder of millions of innocent victims targeted by the Nazis because of their racialist ideology or their belief in eugenic and racist concepts. Because their racial constructs, uh, because of Nazis racial constructs, we also have to include here the massive dislocation of populations in the German occupied East um, based on racial grounds, um, moving Germans to where Poles had once lived, on the argument of Lebensraum, as Timothy Schneider uh, spoke of earlier in our discussion today, the mass displacement of individuals, Jews and non-Jews, who made up the prisoner population in Nazi Germany's vast concentration camp system and who were forced marched into the German interior at the end of World War II. And because so much of the Nazi concept of race is wedded to the idea of aggressive war, to the concept historians now describe of race and space, we also must view World War II in Europe, uh, one of the most deadly and destructive wars in human history as part of the Nazis' racist legacy. Um, and think of all the changes that that war, of course, wrought. I guess as a final note, Part of that legacy is also a warning for modern times. It teaches us that democracies are fragile things, even democracies as old and venerable as our own. And it warns us that or what the demonization of the other and the persecution of minorities can lead to in the hands of a ruthless modern uh, dictatorship. And I'll stop there and I look forward to the comments of my colleagues. Um, I'm going to try share my screen. Um, I have a, a bit of a, a short PowerPoint. I apologize. Um, we've been having a power outage here, so I wasn't able to join for the practice session beforehand. So I'm going to try um, share my PowerPoint screen now. Um, it's not allowing me, so maybe I just... Um, get going with the presentation.
Um, okay, yeah. Um, it doesn't look like I have access to share my screen, so I'll just go ahead and um, and get going with uh, my fifteen minutes. Um, is there? Can everyone hear me? All right. Okay. I'll yes. get going. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, apologies for all these technical uh, problems on my end. It's um, we're going through a bit of a moment with uh, with power issues um, around the country here. Um, so I've organized my um, discussion about race in South Africa through the lens of land. Um, land was central uh, to the creation of South Africa as a settler colony, and was central to ideas of the making of race and of citizenship and of belonging in, in the country. European settlers formalized South Africa's founding sin of land theft from African people by writing themselves into newly created uh, deeds records as the land's rightful owners. These deeds records became their justification for claiming the land and alienating indigenous people from their ancestral homes. Settler colonial law, and the due process that its logic produced became the fetish upon which settlers explained their domination and through which the, uh, they produced a nation, uh, a nation state that they claimed exclusively as their own. Freehold or um, freehold as we call in South Africa, uh, private, uh, private land rights uh, were the instrument through which settlers made stolen land their home and legal entitlement. Freehold centrality in the creation and the reproduction of the settler colony made it sacrosanct. Freehold was a right that was valuable in and of itself. And it made possible the industries that drove the country's economy and that attracted white people from around the world with the allure of riches in South Africa. So for freehold to function in these ways in the creation of South Africa as a place for white people, um, all four of the settler colonies that would become South Africa in 1910 worked to naturalize the relationship between private land ownership or freehold land ownership and white identity. At the same time as these uh, four colonial administrations uh, from the 1600s through to the 1800s, um, legally, politically, and socially linked the most secure land tenure systems with the greatest protections of, uh, for individuals to white identity. They relegated people um, who they racialized as native um, to state-owned reserves and locations. Um, these, co these colonies systematically worked co to construct Black people's land rights and tenure security in collective terms and at the mercy of the state. So at the same time as, in, as individualization is happening through private property rights for white people, collective identity is being forced on people who are racialized as native or, um, or black. Um, I'll come to a moment about um, discussion of the creation of the four major racial categories that um, start um, really gain, brain, gain traction in the late 1800s uh, through to uh, the end of apartheid in 1994 uh, in a moment. Um, but I'll start first with uh, the early um, 1850s in the Transvaal um, colony of South Africa, which is where um, we're going to end up in this talk, where the, uh, an example is going to end up. Uh, the Transvaal colony is where Johannesburg is located, and this became the economic center of South Africa and became, because of this, a central site for ideas of race making. So from the early 1850s uh, through to uh, 1863, the Transvaal government guaranteed European settling uh, within its borders two freehold farms and a township lot as their right. And uh, it continued settling claims to this entitlement until the 1890s. So this meant that simply arriving in the Transvaal colony guaranteed settlers a claim to land and uh, that, the state treated, that the state treated as empty and having no previous ownership. In 1855, uh, Resolution 159 prohibited anybody who was not a burger from owning land and specifically prohibited black people from uh, having rights, um, burger rights in the region and burger rights being a type of citizenship rights. The Transvaal government then explicitly linked the right to land and citizenship to European ancestry and unambiguously excluded African people from the conjoined rights to land ownership and citizenship. In the period immediately after the end of the South African War um, uh, in 1902, this um, one of the most expensive wars of uh, the British Empire at the period that brought people from around the world to defend 
uh, the British colonies against the Boer Republics. Um, at the end of the South African War, as people began the work of rebuilding infrastructure in their lives, the Transvaal government passed what it called the Settlers Ordinance that enabled, uh, quote, agriculturalists and other persons to become occupiers of the land and to eventually become uh, owners, private landowners of this land. Uh, African people were implicitly excluded from both categories of agriculturalist and person. And uh, this showing the British controlled colonies continuation of the Transvaal colonies um, legal conceptualization of the relationship between uh, land rights and race. Going beyond the previous articulations of the relationship though um, between uh, land rights and race, um, the South African government went on to tribalize these uh, conceptualizations of what being black meant in relation to, to land rights. And this was um, explicitly um, illustrated in a 1908 uh, land case where a group of um, black people had collectively purchased land but were not allowed to have this registered in their own names. So they had it registered in the names of the um, Minister of Native Affairs. Um, and when they argued for um, the recognition of this land rights as their own and not as part of a tribal holding, which the minister then um, put it under, uh, the judge in this case reasoned that he said, quote, if any individual or group of persons had been allowed to hold land separately from the rest of the tribe, it would have meant the destruction of the tribal system. For these reasons, I feel strongly that the conclusion must be that under the pure native law and custom, individual ownership was unknown and the ownership was a common ownership by the whole tribe. So in this process, we have freehold land rights as white rights and tribal land rights, which the state now defining what tribal means and where tribal people where tribes can reside as the only way that uh, black people can experience um, any type of uh, tenure, um, tenure security in, in the South African uh, regime. The Petalia judgment spoke to uh, the broader colonial attitude that black people could only legitimately exercise rights to land in the, in the context of a collective. Through this lens, white people could be understood and treated as individuals and their, and their rights similarly recognized, whereas black people were a homogenized whole. In South Africa, um, black people in the Southern African region experienced a particular iteration of settler colonialism that combined subjectivities linked with land dispossession and labor exploitation in one identity and historical experience. This was unlike contexts in the United States and Canada, where indigenous people who were dispossessed of their land and enslaved people whose labor was exploited were differently racialized and the two historical experiences were separate, although intimately connected. The development of white supremacy in Southern Africa reflected the convergence of the repertoires of, of multiple repertoires in global circulation of indigeneity and blackness. Indigeneity in the ways that people were dispossessed of their ancestral land, that tribalism was imagined and was imposed, and that people were forced into reservations and reserves in the creation of the so-called white men's countries. Blackness in the ways that people were racialized as belonging to the lowest position in racial hierarchies that developed in large part through the transatlantic slave trade and ideas of race that, race that were circulating um, through that historical experience. Here also they were constructed as hyper-exploitable hyper and their worth being directly imagined in relation to their physical, into the physical labor that they uh, supplied. The concept of native in South Africa there, they therefore carried these, um, the convergence of these different historical experiences that were in circulation um, around the world. Um, I, I have some maps that I would be showing um, on, on the, um, on the PowerPoint that show the physical um, restriction of Black people to 13% of the South African landmass, just as a visualization of um, what the processes of landlessness, land disposition uh, looked like in terms of 80% of the population living on 13% of the land. But um, I, I'll describe it so you can um, imagine, um, imagine this. And, um, Sorry, I'm sorry. I'm a bit off without my um, without my PowerPoint. Yeah. So um, we have um, the categories of 
native Bantu Black and African being applied to people uh, who are imagined as uh, racialized, as the first uh, racial category in South Africa, and this being linked to ideas of tribalism. Next, ideas of colored people of mixed ancestry as the second category, and Indian um, people who largely came into uh, through um, the Indian Ocean, um, uh, British Empire um, labor migration processes of um, working in plantations, and then white settlers um, who in different uh, historical moments are called European white or settler. Um, is it possible to share my screen? Um, okay. There are some pictures here which might be useful. You um, should to share your screen with that green button at the bottom of the screen. Um, no, it says all panelists or host only. Uh, yeah, if you just hit the button instead of the arrow. You know, there's like a green square. If you hit the green square, that should do it. Um, no. Okay, okay, I apologize. Um, it's not um, coming right there. Um, but in South Africa, what we see happening is um, race fundamentally being defined through um, through processes of land dispossession for Black people and ideas of who can live where and how. So cities largely imagined as spaces um, where Black people provide their labor and come in uh, through um, come in and out as transient workers and um, rural areas imagined as um, tribalized reserves where black people are um, restricted for, um, where their residence is restricted and um, their identity is then linked to this idea of, um, of tribal, of, of homogenized um, tribal identity. Um, I, I'm sorry, I, I'm so um, off with this uh, power outage uh, here right now. Um, but yes, I'll, I'll come back to this idea. Um, can I, during the q and I'll come back to this idea of, um, of racialization through tribalization. But I think what's really useful for thinking about the comparisons here is um, the movement of people that we see, um, the movement of ideas through um, British empire networks, um, through these uh, experiences of um, tribalization through race. And um, then differently the, um, So I would um, suspect that Chucho has fallen victim of Cape Town's failed power system. Um, and so I, I, I'm not going to go, uh, hopefully she'll be able to rejoin us. I'm not gonna, I, and I apologize for that disruption. Um, I'm not gonna be able to um, come up with her final point because I don't know what it was, um, but I hopefully, and I know that she's given me a lot to think about and hopefully has given us all a lot to think about. Um, what we were going to do now is having, you know, once she had finished her presentation, was then to um, begin a conversation across these three different racial regimes and histories that would be both comparative, as the title suggested, as, and, uh, as Tim engaged in his opening comments, but then also could be one where we talk about interaction and we can figure out more and understand how these, these regimes operated in common. Um, I'll take the privilege as, as the moderator to ask the first two questions, which hopefully um, both Patricia and William can engage, and then Chucho, where she'd be able to come back, would be able to as well. And if she's unable to, um, I will, since I also am a specialist in South Africa, I could attempt and hazard a couple answers to my own questions as well. 
Um, and there's a number of different things that I see here. And it, it's really striking when we look at these three different regimes, how they ha obviously have a great deal in common, but there's also a great deal of distinction. Um, they have different intellectual histories, although overlapping intellectual histories in many cases, as, as our panelists have pointed out. And they also use different instruments um, public violence, for example, in the case of the Jim Crow South, as well as the more quotidian segregation. But then also, of course, um, oh, Tutu came back for a second there. But also, of course, um, the not just uh, these the, the systems of, of public violence, but also they use, um, they have different ways of defining in-groups versus out-groups and the ways in which society is supposed to respond to that essential classification. Um, I'm going to just kind of pose, and Tuto, if you can, I don't know if you can hear me, if you could just speak to these questions as we're moving into the last stage of the presentation here. Um, I have a couple of questions that strike that are based on the afterlives of these racial regimes. To some extent, there is an urge, and I think Patricia reminded us, that even though we think that these regimes are, in many senses, consigned to the past, there's always the danger that they will be resurrected in various forms. Um, and so I want to engage that in two levels. The first is I'm curious if you could talk a bit, each of you, about how these regimes are remembered, how they're discussed and debated publicly. What is the official position on them in these various states? And some will obviously be more familiar to us than others. But then also, what about the shadow memory of these sorts of things, especially on places like in, in online discourse, for example? And here I'm thinking about People like, unfortunately, it's not a pleasant thought, but think about people like Dylan Roof, the perpetrator of the, the Amy Church massacre in Charleston, in Charleston, excuse me, a few years ago, who, when authorities went through and researched his online habits, discovered that he spent a lot of time thinking about apartheid and concomitant regimes elsewhere in Southern Africa and had imbibed a great deal of South African racist rhetoric. How do we see these these regimes that are so state-centered, how do we see them have lives that prove Professor Snyder's point about the global history or the global nature of these histories? Secondly, and here's a, maybe a more provocative question, but one that I hope that each of you would be able to engage, do what else lingers from these racial regimes? And do can we see echoes of those racial regimes still existing in these countries? And one area in particular that I would love to hear your comments on is it strikes me that in the United States, obviously, in Germany, obviously, and familiar to probably fewer people in our audience in South Africa today, immigration is quite a hot button issue around which new forms of racialization, I would argue, are taking place. It would be really interesting to hear each of you reflect on that if you could, and to, to talk about the afterlives of these three racial structures and where we see them, um, where we see contemporary manifestations of them today. Um, we can kind of go in order to engage either of those questions, um, and then Tuto will give you a bit of time since you're now able to be back, back with us to kind of add any comments that you weren't able to add before your unfortunate technological difficulties. Thanks. Thank you so much for those, those um, really compelling questions, Dan. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's so much to say about that. One thing that I wanna point out with the afterlife of the Jim Crow regime is how many people are still around who grew up in that regime and were very much affected by it. My, my own father was born in Arkansas in 1948. I'm the oldest um, in my generation. So I'm the first generation in my family born outside of the Jim Crow South. And I think about this all the time, but basically anybody over the age of 57 years old or about 55, 56, 57 years old who was born in the South grew up in that era. And so, you know, it was it was totalizing, right? I mean, it was everywhere. It was like these lessons that, that you learn on the streets, it's in lessons that you learn in school. And we still have a very large portion of our population that is very much affected by what they learned growing up in that racial regime. My father certainly not excluded from that. And I think that really plays into memory, the way that people were taught about reconstruction, you know, is very much in line with you know, neo-Confederate memory that was really crafted during this, this Jim Crow era. Confederate monuments are obviously the most important part. But in school, people were also taught that when African-Americans could vote during Reconstruction, 
they were irresponsible, that they came after white people's power and authority and their land. And I think that very much shapes people's modern political sensibilities. And, um, you know, all of these things that linger, I think, like different points about, you know, people often make a point about like the breakdown of the black family. They often point to the end of Jim Crow as the moment that that really starts to happen, you know, like the 1960s when African-Americans got a lot more civil rights and they were, you know, they got more access to federal welfare programs, whatever that might be. But then also perhaps the most disappointing way that this still lingers with us today is this debate over Confederate monuments. You know, we still have, we, we celebrate both ends of this regime. We celebrate Martin Luther King Jr. and people that sought to tear it down. But then all over the South, our landscape is littered with county names and city names and street names and Confederate monuments that celebrate the people that erected the regime. We really celebrate both sides of this. And so one of the things that I think is so troubling today is the way that Confederate monuments have entered our political discourse in a way that really draws out a lot of voters that along racial lines that basically do what the Confederate monuments were supposed to do in the first place. And that's that identify, you know, white or black and vote along those lines. And it's really quite striking how that particular issue can serve to divide, especially working class, poor, working class black and white voters today. I'll stop there. Yeah, I, as, as far as what lingers, I mean, obviously this is a really powerful legacy. So many things came as a result of, of World War II, so many changes and, and it's really, Nazi aggression and you know the invasion and occupation of so much of Europe, and causing so many changes. Of course, I and I, I alluded that to that in 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 my part of the discussion. Of course, all of that geographical change, all of those population transfers, all of the loss, um, all of the displacement of that, of course, is what remains. Um, but I think also. You know, it's 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 in a sense Nazism kind of washes out with the unconditional um, surrender of the Nazis and the total breakdown of the German infrastructure right after World War II. And you have the Allies come in and they bring in, you know, and in comes a new fledgling German democracy, which I think is a really is an experience in democracy has been very successful along with the communist state and then the integration of those two states into, I think, a really successful experiment, new experiment in German democracy. But it took a long time for those ghosts of the past really to leave. Sure, Nazi Germany is destroyed. You have uh, on one side a federal republic, um, and the other side you have East Germany, um, also committed to anti-Nazism because of its connection in the uh, communist bloc. But at the same time, there's so much of an afterlife that stays for so many, for at least a generation or two, um, because those individuals, those same officials who are the judges, who are the police, uh, who are the physicians, who are some modern political leaders, are still, the, the, especially the infrastructure of the Justice Department, uh, the police, those individuals uh, who are not denazified outright because they've committed uh, serious crimes stay where they are. And I liked very much what William said when he talked about this being real grassroots, um, you know, to enforce racial policy. And that was true uh, in Nazi Germany too. And the enforcement of things like laws uh, the laws themselves had another kind of afterlife in Nazi Germany because of the way officials interpreted them to give them even a more radical interpretation. And those people stay in office. They stay in, on their judges' benches. They stay as members of the police. They stay as you know, magnets in, in, in industrial society. And those people remain who are not punished. They remain. And that, that sort of Shadow, of course, it's, 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 a, it's a, um, for West Germany. It's still a democracy, and it, you know, and and then the, the the country is reunified in 1989. But you still you have it, it takes a certain amount of time for that sort of sort of aftermath to to dissipate. Um, I 
let me see, what else did I scribble down here while I was, um, you know, that, that even though the mainstream goes back to being a republic, um, it takes a while for that, for, for those suggestions, the way that people live, the way they adjudicated things, the laws, the way the police respond, all of those things, the way doctors treat their patients, it, it's, it all remained for a time being because those individuals remained in society even after the Nazi state was no more. So I think you know, that's something that one has to consider when you look at this history. Um, thank you. I apologize again um, for those uh, technical problems, um, but I think I should be able to share now the screen. And um, if I could just go, if I could abuse my remaining time a bit just to um, integrate the uh, answers into uh, what's remaining of my presentation. Um, so this, uh, the first line is, um, is uh, with this native colored Indian and European. The first line there, native Bantu black, refers to different categories that were used to describe indigenous people. Native was first when European settlers were trying to argue that these are indigenous people and trying to make this a pejorative term. Uh, this switches to Bantu um, around the um, mid century, around the time that apartheid begins in 1948, when generations of white, uh, white South Africans started to understand themselves as, as local and part of the South African uh, fabric and try now to frame indigenous people as not um, having the same sorts of ties to the place as they do. So Bantu being the broad linguistic group that spans from East to Central to Southern Africa being used to um, refer to indigenous people. And this um, is an idea that's still coming out today as relevant when with the debates about land and there are um, some far right groups that argue that actually um, black people, African people in, um, in South Af arrived in South Africa around the same time as European settlers. So they both have equal claims to the land, even with the um, violent uh, history of land dispossession so well documented by scholars. This languaging around Bantu um, continues to have a uh, potency in uh, the far right imagination of claims to claims to the place, claims to South Africa and, and land in South Africa. Um, so then this being what I was uh, starting to describe earlier, that um, black people being restricted to uh, particular parts of the country and these being designated as native, uh, native locations, native reserves, and private land ownership being designated as universally white and part of uh, citizenship. Uh, citizen, citizenship claims. So here uh, is a visual representation of the areas to which um, Black people were restricted in South Africa. And um, when we think about the afterlives of the laws that um, I'll look at in a moment uh, very quickly, um, that restricted Black people to these areas, um, there's a in 2018, there was a, a major court case that went up to the Constitutional Court in South Africa, South Africa's highest court, where a group of uh, descendants of people who bought, Black people who bought land in 1916 are still challenging to have these uh, property rights recognized because the state still insists that their land is tribal land and that individual rights can't exist in the areas that are shaded here as part of the tribal reserves that were set up and under colonialism. And um, a number of court cases around, um, around these areas where um, titanium, platinum, a range of uh, rare minerals have been discovered and uh, black people are being evicted from their land under uh, um, the auspices of tribal law where companies go and negotiate with, um, with chiefs and uh, have people who have been living on this land for generations now displaced um, for mining to happen. So this being a direct legacy of the imagining of black land rights as um, as collective and as tribal and as um, as a lot less secure than our white people's land rights. And this map is a visualization of um, the process of forced removals um, An estimated close to four million people were forcibly removed to uh, create 
these uh, tribal reserves. And these red lines showing the extent to which um, people were uh, transported, forcibly moved um, across the country for the creation of this myth of these coherent tribes that are linked to particular geographies and these geographies determining the rights that they um, can claim from the state or um, even under democracy not be able to claim from the state. The extent to which the state is, um, is not um, responsible to them. Uh, and here just an illustration of the, um, the legislative assault um, against uh, Black people's land rights and the explicit linking of these uh, this legislative process to um, to the ideas of what it means to be black, what it means to be um, white, and what uh, responsibilities the state has to different people um, in these racial categories. So um, the first ones I had started to speak about um, the restricting of land rights to citizenship rights through um, these resolutions then. Um, restricting of black people to 7% of the land, um, exclusion of black people from, um, from urban areas. And in 1927, significantly, the Nationality Act defines what it means to become a South African citizen. So being born in South Africa, having a South African father, marrying a South African, those sorts of of steps towards claiming citizenship. And uh, significantly in the same year, uh, the government passes the Native Administration Act, which says um, well, how tribes are created, how the states can um, designate who's part of which tribes, where uh, the tribal boundaries um, start and end, and who um, tribal leaders are. So in the year that it is defining citizenship as universal, um, supposedly, in its um, attempts to represent South Africa's attempts to represent itself as a democracy, it um, concurrently develops native administration law that curtails Black people's ability to um, to access citizenship rights and designates these rights as tribal rather than uh, state linked. Um, so just over these um, next two slides, just a demonstration of um, law after law restricting where black people can live, how they can use their land, um, when they can be moved and uh, what the claims to being moved are. And um, up until um, 1994, when um, apartheid formally ends and process of land restitution uh, formally begins. But even uh, through this process of land restitution, the state um, has taken more than 20 years trying to um, compensate white landowners for their land and individually evaluate each piece of land that was taken from uh, white people and has uh, issued a policy of standard settlement for all black um, landowners who were dispossessed under colonialism. So at the same time as the state is literally bankrupting itself to try and pay off um, white citizens whose land um, would be uh, redistributed to black people, it is offering blanket uh, standardized compensation to, to white people, I mean to black people. So what I see as um, really fundamental here is that even under democracy, the state cannot imagine black and white people having um, citizenship um, claims that are equal and cannot imagine itself having the same sorts of responsibilities to people who are racialized um, as historically would have been racialized as European and those who have historically been racialized as native. And this plays out in a host of, um, of areas uh, as it does in the United States and um, other uh, former colonies around the world, uh, where whether it's um, life expectancy rates that are linked to environmental conditions and housing conditions and access to healthcare. Um, in as Dan mentioned, uh, the question of uh, violence linked to immigration in South Africa, um, the attacks against um, violent attacks of um, migrants into South Africa from other African countries as part of this um, idea of tribalism that was fueled under colonialism being expressed through um, Africans uh, from outside South Africa being imagined is um, particularly foreign in comparison to Europeans who immigrate to South Africa who can be easily integrated into the South African state and not face the same kind of violence and understanding of taking opportunities as people who um, 
would have been part of this tribal system or excluded from the tribal system um, experience in South Africa. So I think these legacies for me are really devastating in the direct material um, ways that they continue to live out in the ways that um, these uh, areas that were historically designated as tribal continue to be treated separately from the rest of the country. And then in the many insidious ways that the state continues to understand its responsibilities to um, white people as, um, as taking, uh, as having greater importance than its responsibilities to um, people in the other three racial categories, particularly people who were historically um, racialized as native. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Tuto. Can you, yeah, all right, uh, there we are. Um, well, first of all, Brilliant job by all three of you. Um, we said that I was gonna offer a response and I will very briefly because we do have some questions from the audience and I welcome even more. Uh, thank you for sending them in. We'll get to them in a moment. Um, I just wanna run through a few quick items that I felt were alive in all three presentations whether this is interaction or comparison, I'm not sure yet. <laughs> First of all, extremism always comes in stages. None of these systems were born, you know, uh, full blown from the beginning. They grow in stages, which is of course a lesson for the time we're living in right now. What stage of authoritarianism are we in in America? Well, we're not sure, are we? We don't even often wanna ask. Uh, secondly, Extremism of any kind, systems of racism, systems of, of authoritarianism need a story. They all need a narrative. They draw on a story. The Nazis drew so deeply on, as Patricia laid out, the defeat in World War I, the, uh, 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 the problem of the stab in the back, et cetera, et cetera. They drew deeply on that. The American Jim Crow system draws so deeply on a deep mythology of the Reconstruction era. And of course, the Afrikaners in South Africa were always drawing. I'm drawing here off my South African history of 40 years ago, but off the Vortrekkers and that, that great myth of, of, of taking the land for, for a holy cause and so on. And in that sense, uh, as soon as I finish in a moment, I'd like each of you, if you would, at least briefly, to say how much of these regimes were built on a kind of lost cause. That's a huge question. Whole books have been written on that. Um, third, all, of, all three regimes have deep economic elements. That's clear, whether it's land or labor. Uh, there were Jim Crow jobs, uh, as we well know. Um, and then comes fourthly, this question of biology. Biology scientific racism uh, of, of, of various kinds and uses. And it never dies, does it? Whether it's in the eugenic, the extreme eugenics of the 1920s or, or whether it's in new forms of this. We can talk forever about the social construction of race. And we keep, we in the academy are continually surprised at the way biological racism still survives out in the minds of people walking on our very streets. Um, notions of racial destiny are all over all three regimes, it seems to me in one way or another. And then next, the role of the state, the role of government, the role of nationalism in each of these. Think about Afrikaner nationalism. Uh, German nationalism, my God, you know, it is a nationalist system that they create. And then in America, William, we have the dual, pro we have American federalism to deal with. This is in some ways entirely a state's rights dilemma, state's rights story at the same time, it's a national story. That makes it sort of uniquely American because of our federalism. And then I guess I just wanna say lastly here, I hope everybody couldn't help thinking as I have throughout these wonderful presentations of this, this, 
tender, tender thing we are constantly talking about now, and that's democracy. You know, biology and ethnicity, the idea of racist destiny, it, it's a beguiling way of thinking. In some ways, it's an easier way of thinking than it is to think in truly deep democratic terms, because democracy means giving up something. Democracy means cooperating. Democracy means we're going to be equal, even, at t even with people we don't like, even with, with people we don't even want to tolerate. But we're going to be equal, at least before law. And so all three of these historical phenomena here not only have afterlives, but they're in the very events we read about every day from Africa, from Europe, and from the United States. I could have said a whole lot more. The geography story here, Tutu, that you told, the way that South African geography and expansion and movement, and then eventually tr so-called tribal lands, removal of peoples, my God, that's of course part of the American story too. And no doubt, Lebensraum was all about that in a way, different, but similar uh, in what, in when Germany expanded in Europe. We should get to some of these questions. How about this lost cause business? Uh, to what extent, Patricia, is the Nazi regime, the Nazism, a kind of result of a lost cause mentality that, you know, that just necessitated that kind of a story? Yeah, that's it. I, I hadn't really thought of it before, but that fits very neatly, doesn't it, into it, that you have this, this group uh, in, in, uh, in the Jim Crow South, it's, it's the whites, and with the Germans, of course, it's their race, but just as this terrible loss of Weimar, and, you know, it, it's the same sort of scenario, isn't it? Um, maybe not with war, war um, you know, debts and things like this, which caused disaster for the German economy, but certainly in terms of, right, the lost cause and that, that grievance, right, and the, in that it feeds, as many people have stated, on the on some mythology that grows out of Reconstruction. I'm I'm not very good with American history, as my husband, an American historian, can tell you, uh, but I do know that the the mythology that grows out of that Reconstruction is is very similar to the kind of the kind of story of the lost cause of in World War One for for Germany, and then you have that other. Uh, that you blame for that wrong and for um, for the Nazis, it was uh, Democrats, small d, uh, Jews, and socialists in the German rear. Who, who, even though no one alien has set foot on German soil in an invasion or you know in in, in defeating Germany, they go ahead and surrender. Well, they had to because they were at the point where they needed to surrender. But the stab in the math back. Uh, myth is it's a myth just because of that but it explains so much they have a narrative that they understand that explains it to them and then there's the other whom we're going to punish because they are the fault of our our um, our lost cause the fault of, uh, of our lost war it fits in very neatly it's a very interesting idea that that that's sort of the same sort of thing as the Germans nurtured about World War one yeah, Tuto, is South Africa still a society roiling with various lost causes, or is that not even the right term? Um, I definitely think that um, historical narratives continue to um, fuel a lot of political um, uh, discontent today. I think that colonial narratives around the idea of, similarly to the US, of the empty territory that was not being used and the lazy natives are central to understandings today about um, economic inequality and um, the lots of social um, and political um, challenges that come from that deep uh, rooted inequality. And I think these narratives are central to its perpetuation today, absolutely. Alan William, I mean, we, we, in, in, among Americanists, it's almost uh, a creed that the lost cause and the Jim Crow system evolved together. But how did they fuel one another? 
You know, I think one of the interesting things in the American context is that you get one racial regime that's replacing another. So there was this moment of reconstruction, obviously, but, you know, everybody making the rules with the Jim Crow, with, with the growth of the Jim Crow South had lived, you know, during the antebellum era, almost everyone. And so one of the interesting things about the lost cause, if we just sort of get rid of the Civil War for a minute, was the way that they had to reframe what the institution of slavery actually was. So even though the lost causers were coming out over and over and saying, well, slavery wasn't the cause of the Civil War, they were also saying, but by the way, the enslaved people during the antebellum era were A, they were happier, right? There were these happily, you know, these happy servants and that slavery wasn't that bad and that they demonstrated better social and political behavior than these newly emancipated people do now. And that was you know, threaded throughout all of their historical narratives about what the old racial regime used to be like in order to justify the new racial regime. Yeah, I do think Americans, some Americans today anyway, especially young people find it baffling sometimes how deeply rooted these stories of contented slaves and so on became in American culture. It's just everywhere by the 1890s into the early 20th century. Would, would any of you or all three of you venture from your study of these systems, a comment at least on why race and biology uh, is so enduring, so beguiling to we humans? Uh, why, why is it? Uh, is it because the nurture nature issue has never been, you know, fully, fully, completely explained or, or what? I mean, what is it about biology and race that we just can't seem to separate? Thoughts? Patricia, maybe, as a start? <laughs> For one thing, I'm thinking, you know, I, I, there's a lot of these Nazi propaganda films around sterilization, for instance, yeah. uh, which I mentioned in my talk today. And um, in this, they always show the farmer, right? The farmer is out and he's, mm. he's, um, he's pulling the weeds from his field and he's carefully breeding his cows and his cattle. And so much of this kind of rhetoric, so much of that makes actual sense, right? We do pull weeds out of our garden. We do yeah. get rid of the shaft to get what's really valuable. Yeah, yeah. We do breed, you know, for, for selective breeding. So in certain sense, that makes sense to the common man and to, especially in an agrarian culture, it just, it resounds with them. But yet the, the you know, what, what they're actually saying, what the, what, what the consequences of following that in a radical way are, um, we see with the Nazi period, right? So, um, but I think it's, in a certain sense, it resounds because it sounds like sense. Yeah. Uh, when it when in fact it's not so I don't know maybe somebody that's actually to... interesting because when you when, I mean there's a natural destiny to how you grow wheat <laughs> you know so people throughout time have thought well why isn't there nat natural destiny to races or ethnicities or groups or nations and so on and so forth I don't know uh, Tutu any thoughts on that Th this is a tough one I know it's 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 for the philosophers and biologists to fight out but. Any thoughts on that? Um, I think uh, I think it allows people with privilege to explain away uh, a lot. I think that um, if people don't have to take responsibility for the fact that um, inequality is manufactured and sustained by people, then um, and there's if there's a shortcut for explaining um, why black people have the highest you know mortality rates and the highest poverty rates and the highest unemployment rates, if those can be explained away by nature, I think that it makes a lot of people um, comfortable. What what? <laughs> William, any thoughts on that one? Yeah, I agree with that. I think that's right. And I think it's about power. One of the disturbing things about our own society now is the way that people are still willing to use race as an organizing principle in order to, you know, recruit vo voters. You know, obviously, we see that um, very clearly today, whether it's illegal immigrants or whatever, you know, um, people are still you people are still using race you know, as it exists in our society in order to mobilize voters to their political party in ways that can obviously be very, very dangerous by exacerbating these existing prejudices. Well, all well said. I, I, I just want to end with a, a, a very short passage from a notorious book 
um, it's from the American setting because that's what I know. Most people have perhaps heard of Thomas Dixon. He wrote the book called The Klansman Upon Which Birth of a Nation, the notorious film was made. He also wrote a later novel called The Flaming Sword, uh, published in 1939. And in this book, it, again, it's this brutally racist story uh, about a young girl who grows up, product of a rape, of course, black man on a white woman, and so on and so forth. Um, but Dixon creates this beguiling story about race and how the white race must rise. He makes it, again, an epic about the white race. The white race must rise to hold back all of these isms in America. And he says um, uh, that they, they must rise up to save this American Republic because the race problem, he says, race problem is unsolved and insoluble. And then he goes on to say, the found, I quote him, the foundation and justification of a crusade to rid our country of influences and activities which for years have been secretly dynamiting the pillars of our nation. We hear the same rhetoric today, frankly, from the American right. I, I can't speak for South Africa or all that's going on in Europe, but there's this idea, there's, there's something there called an American nation or was it the German nation or was it the Afrikaner nation that had to be preserved? Uh, you know, something precious that other people are taking away. Dick's, this third novel in his great trilogy of these racist epics didn't sell terribly well because there was so much else going on in 1939, the truth of American attention, like the war in Europe. Uh, uh, so thankfully that book didn't get uh, but he stole his title from W.E.B. Du Bois. Uh, I don't think he should be forgiven for that either. But anyway, uh, I want to I want to first thank Tim Snyder and, and Dan Magaziner, who is probably still on here with us. Dan, thank you for for taking all this on and helping us organize this. Tuto, thanks for tuning in through all of the technical troubles from Cape Town. Patricia, thank you for bringing all your wisdom from the Holocaust Museum and your scholarship. And William, uh, uh, Man, you've become, you've become our go-to historian of the entire Jim Crow period. So stay, stay with us, man. Uh, and thank you all for attending today. We had a great audience. And uh, uh, good night for now. And tune into the GLC uh, website and other places where you'll see all the, the other events that we still have coming. Thanks, everybody, for attending. And thanks especially to our panel here. Dan, William, Tutu, and 